Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger, and I see I've already got a lively crowd. I've all, uh, unbelievable, the questions, I love it. Okay, uh, so appreciate a thumbs up if you can hear me. And um, just a couple of normal announcements. If you want me to cover a topic, tag me in your chat comment. Otherwise, I skip it. Uh, and there will be timestamps. I've, I've got Matt, who's been helping me. So he's probably watching, maybe. I don't know. Uh, he's been doing a great job on the timestamps. Uh, usually six to 10 hours after the video goes live. Um, so that that's good. Uh, and just checking to make sure we got thumbs up. Good. Thanks, Riley. I want to begin today with a topic that uh, I, I've received it a couple of different times. This one comes from a listener named Jeffrey. And it's an interesting topic, and it's this. Should the amount of money we have to invest affect how we invest? And kind of related to that, is there some benefit to, you know, to having a somewhat complicated portfolio? And by that, I mean, just as an example, rather than, say, a total U.S. stock fund or even a total world stock fund like Vanguard's V ticker VT, uh, breaking it down, having small cap, small cap growth and value, mid two, two mid caps maybe, and some large caps, and breaking it all out, right? And uh, I think they're kind of related. I'm of the view, and I'll, and I'll explain why, that it, at least for that portion of your money that's invested in, you know, the, we'll just stick with the stock market for, for a moment. Uh, it, it shouldn't matter how much you have. The, 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 way, the way that I would invest is no different than it, whether I'm investing $1,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, or 100 million. Uh, now, you know, when you get to 100 million, you might invest in different ways because you can buy whole companies and maybe you're just really interested in some type of business and you want to own it. And it's as much about uh, the fun of owning the business, let's say, as it is investing. That's fine, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the portion you know, you'd put in the stock and bond market. And um, I think, let's say you've got a three fund portfolio or maybe four or five, but some reasonable number of, let's say, low cost index funds. And now let's just magically say you're going to invest 100 million. Why would you change that? Now, let's kind of think of reasons why we might say, okay, we got to change things. One would be, I suppose, we think a different approach will make us more money, right? I mean, that's that's certainly sensible. If we have, you know, there's no guarantees, of course, but if, if we have a reasonable belief that some different approach to investing, you know, breaking it up into, I don't know, 20 different funds <laughs> or whatever, will we'll generate more money for us, then why aren't we doing that now? I mean, in other words, you know, you don't need a lot of money to do that. I mean, you know, you can literally, have a 20 fund portfolio if that's what you want with 25 bucks in M1 finance <laughs> and dollar cost average or whatever. So if, if you've decided that whatever, a four fund portfolio is right for you, I'm not sure a hundred million dollars should change that just because, you know, again, if you think there's some better approach to investing, go ahead and do it now. Maybe you'll get to hundred million faster. <laughs> Maybe not, but you know, it, unless you have some reason to think it's going to generate better returns, that, 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 you know, you'd probably do that anyway. A second reason might be uh, you might not be better returns, but it'll reduce your volatility, greater diversity, right? Well, I think there's at least two problems with that. The first is, again, kind of like with making better returns, if you think you can, uh, if there's a way to invest uh, where you can have the same expected return, but greater diversity such uh, that your volatility is lower, the ups and downs are lower. Do that now. There, you know, with, with the investing tools available today, with relatively small amounts of money, you can build as complicated a portfolio as you want. Uh, whether that's on M1 or even a traditional broker like a Fidelity or, or Schwab or whatever. So again, uh, you don't need a lot of money to do that. And I suspect that's probably not what most people have in mind anyway when they think about investing a large sum, sum of money. But the other part of that is diversity. But here's the thing. If we take, let's take a look at VT. Let me pull it up on the screen for a minute. I was, gonna, I was in the process of looking at all of 
Jim Cramer's past predictions about different things, including that in, in April 2020, you, sh you should not be buying index funds. <laughs> you should be buying individual stocks, some of which did well that he mentioned, some of them didn't. Oh, that was kind of funny. Um, anyway, VT, let's just use this as an example. So here it is in Morningstar. So we're talking about diversity, right? Well, this owns, as, as you probably know, international and US stocks, right? Uh, it's just one fund, but that really doesn't tell us anything. The number that, That's something to keep in mind. The number of funds in a portfolio tells you nothing about its diversity. And we've seen in past videos where uh, investment advisors will have multiple funds that, that cover the same asset class, that's, which is practically doing nothing, right? Anyway, see, I'm already fired up. It's only seven minutes past the hour. Anyway, look at this, 9,000 holdings. <laughs> You know, now I suppose you could say, well, it's cap weighted, so there it's 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 weighted in favor of the large companies. Okay, uh, but this still is an incredibly diverse portfolio. And if we wanted to break it up and say, well, we'll do a total U.S. stock fund like VTI and a total international fund like VXUS, so we can control how much we have in U.S. versus international companies. Fine, uh, uh, but it's still incredibly uh, diverse. And so uh, I, I personally just don't see a need to complicate the portfolio uh, simply because you have more money, whatever that is for you. And I just used $100 million because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go out on a limb and say most of you don't have $100 million to invest. No, I don't. Um, yeah, I would invest it the same way. Again, I might carve out chunks and go you know, buy a company or do some private equity, although I actually wouldn't. <laughs> That's just too complicated. It's not too complicated and hard to understand. It's like, I just don't want to spend my time that way. So I actually wouldn't. I would invest $100 million the way I invest today. Uh, but, but whatever portion of that you just keep in the stock market, I see absolutely no reason to uh, make it more complicated. And you know, one question, and, and Jeffrey mentioned this in his email to me, uh, apart from the amount of money, is, is there an argument to say, if you have like a you know an eight or ten fund portfolio where you're sort of breaking up all the pieces, can that possibly give you some benefit because you can rebalance and maybe get a little extra return? There might be an argument for that. I did a video; it's in the channel. You can search for it. It's called Opportunistic Rebalancing. And really, the important thing there is not so much the video I did, but but an article, a study that I reference. And um, and I don't remember how many asset classes they used in that study. I just can't remember. It may not have been that many, actually. But there was a slight increase, but we're talking marginal. Um, and of course, there's no guarantee that will replicate itself in the future. But it was, my recollection, maybe a half a percent. And I'm not dismissive of a half a percent. Uh, uh, but, you know, you just got to keep in mind that it involves a lot more complexity. They were talking about examining the portfolio like every couple of weeks or every 60 days. And then you've got tax issues. And so it, you know, it's not as simple as just snap your fingers and let's just do opportunist, opportunistic rebalancing. So that's my take. I really don't believe that the amount of money should change how we invest. And I'll, I'll tell you, though, uh, advisors, at, well, they, they by and large think we should be complicated regardless of what we have. I had a, a viewer email me the other day. Um, I think it was Prime America, but I may have that wrong. They had them in 35 funds. And they wanted to add more. It's like, are you kidding me? Um, when, when I had some money to invest after I sold a part of my business, I talked to an advisor and I, I had no plans of ever hiring them. Um, but I had a phone call and they wanted to put me in all kinds of complicated stuff, expensive non-traded REITs, uh, the, a black swan portfolio that was supposedly could predict the unpredictable and then protect me from it. Um, and it was just, it's just nonsense. Um, so... That's my take. By the way, feel free to disagree with me. Um, just, you know, kind of be nice. Maybe. Anna. Okay, now the, now the important stuff, your questions. So remember, tag me if you want me to cover a topic. There will be timestamps. Oh, one other thing. The email, I love and keep sending it, but it's just overwhelming. Um, so I'm not going to be responding. I've got to, I read every email and I have a saved template that I reply. So I'll literally read every email, paste the template in and send it back to you. I, you know, I, can't, I just don't have the time to craft and sit there and type responses. It's, it's like 25 to 50 emails a day. 
I'm literally, and this is not from that, but I literally have like repetitive stress, like this shoulder. I, I, I mean, I literally, I'm going to a chiropractor for this whole side of my body. Anyway, you, you didn't really need to know that. Um, okay. One thing I'm doing for my shoulders is called crossover symmetry. Um, if you have shoulder issues, Google it. I bought mine from Rogue. It's just resistance bands and a program, but it's pretty good. All right. Enough of my physical ailments. Anna says, I would like to increase my bond allocation as it is now at zero. All right. Well, you can only go up. Well, I guess you could short it, go down. But anyway, what metrics, yields, events should I pay attention to to decide when to buy? So there are two, there are two approaches to investing. This is true with bonds. It's true with everything. Well, there, no, there's, there's three approaches, I think. Uh, one approach is to look at valuations. This is the Warren Buffett approach. He's going to invest in something if he thinks it's a good value. That's it, right? Is it is it trading at or below its intrinsic value? And is it a good whatever? He's invested in bonds and preferred stocks. And so he would just do an evaluation. Um, my hunch is, based on what he said, uh, that at present, he wouldn't, buy, he wouldn't invest in bonds. Now, maybe there could be some high yield opportunity and he's evaluated the balance sheet of the company. I don't know. But by and large, he is staying out of bonds, as far as I know. I mean, he has short term, like treasuries, just to hold cash. But so that, but that's one approach. It's just based on valuation. And right as we all know, bond prices are very high. Um, another approach is kind of what you're alluding to, Anna, and that is sort of read the tea leaves. Get, get out your crystal ball. Which way is the market going to go? Maybe do some charting, some technical analysis. What do you think the Fed's going to do? Uh, I'm not a believer in that approach. I don't think most people, most of the time, can consistently um, build wealth that way. You might have some big winners, but you're probably going to have some big losers too. Uh, and in my experience, trying to predict the interest rates uh, uh, and what the Fed's going to do. I mean, they, they, they've gotten better. I'm not sure this is a good thing of sort of projecting what they're going to do. Uh, but even that's changed, right? I mean, at one point, they weren't going to raise rates till, was it 23? Some ridiculous number. This is like a year or two ago, and I'm thinking, how can you make that 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 commitment? And and they're not. They're going to raise rates. Uh, they say say they are this year. So I'm not a big believer in that at all. And then that leaves us with the just sort of dollar cost average buy into a bond fund. Could be a total U.S. bond fund like BND from Vanguard. Uh, you know, you could mix in some tips. Um, you know, if it's in a taxable account, you can consider municipal bond funds. But you just sort of buy in as part of your regular contributions, whether it's through a 401k at work or an IRA or a taxable account. And you kind of do that the same way with stocks and you don't really look at what's going on. One of the interesting, by the way, that's my, well, I use sort of the Warren Buffett approach. Well, that's probably giving my approach way too much credit. I try to emulate Warren Buffett for my stock portfolio, but everything else is just throw it in there and, and just and then just chill, right? Uh, but, but one thing I've been thinking a lot about, you know, I, I showed you VT on the screen a minute ago. That's just, you know, one fund and you've got all, all your stocks throughout the world. And I thought about, well, well I don't use that. Uh, I don't think it's a bad fund at all. I think it would be a reasonable approach. I don't use it. And, and it, most of the people that I've dealt with, and I get dozens of portfolios sent to me every week from you guys. I don't think I've ever seen someone with VT in their portfolio, maybe one time. And I thought, well, why is that? Um, now, one might say, well, you know, I don't like the U.S. versus international allocation, and I've decided that we, it has to be different. That would probably be my, my answer. I'm not sure how wise it is, but that's probably my answer. But I think there's something else going on. And it has to do with the difference between, this is going to sound odd, driving a car and taking a plane. I'm not afraid of flying. I've flown, I don't know, 500 times, 1,000 times? I'm not sure. A lot. Uh, but... You know, it's still even after all that time, and I've been through some turbulence, it can be a little nerve wracking from time to time. Uh, but driving a car, you know, you just get in and you do it. Now, part of it is because you drive a car every day and most of us don't fly every day. But I also think, and this is going to get us back to VT and the point, is when you're driving, you have control or at least some measure of control. And when you're in an airplane, at least unless you're the pilot, uh, you have no control. And we don't like that. I don't, we don't like feeling, we don't like situations where we can't influence the outcome, particularly when it involves life and death or our money. 
And I think there's a sense that with one fund like VT, um, and maybe a target date type retirement fund is another example, perhaps, we don't feel like we're influencing the outcome much. We don't have con- any, that much control. It's like we're just boarding a plane and hopefully it lands us safely in retirement. But if we have three, even just three funds or seven funds, or we, we complicate it a bit, it, it feels like we now have more control. We're, we got a hold of the steering wheel, right? And I think there's part of me that would that, that accurately describes. Um, yeah, I'm not sure it's a good thing. <laughs> the, the, the control is a two-edged sword anyway. Um, all right, Jay. Uh, and by the way, I think it's, at, I don't know if it's, it's at Rob Berger. Uh, some of you have just put at Rob, but I see it, so it's okay. But if you put at Rob Berger, it actually lights up orange. All right. But I, I see the ones that are just at Rob. I think one of your old videos says lump sum is better in general than dollar cost averaging. Yes, it does. What about in today's context? See, and I think I said that in the video, but the studies say that throwing it all in versus, say, dollar cost averaging over a year or, or whatever it, it, in more, more, is more likely than not to be the better outcome. And we can understand that conceptually because in most years, the market goes up, right? And we can, I can show you on the screen here. SP 500 returns by year. I think we get this one site that I've shown you before. Here it is. Yeah. So here are returns. These are, I think these are just price returns. I don't think they include dividends, but you know, um, this goes all the way back to 1926, 28. Uh, there's more green than red, right? So, you know, in, in, in most of the time, dollar cost averaging will underperform lump sum investing in, in, in all times, except when it doesn't. And there's no way to know ahead of time. You know, we look back at the chart, you know, at the start of, at the start of 28, I don't know if it's going to be green or red, right? Same thing with every year. So, but as 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 Jay, you point out, does that factor in the the, the price level, the valuation level? We could think of the Schiller, the the the, the PE, the um, you know, the cyclical PE that looks at ten years worth. Well, I can show it to you. <laughs> uh, PE of SP five hundred. I think it's the first site that comes up. Yeah. And if we go to, I think it's down here, the Schiller PE. Here it is. I don't know why my screen is like. Okay. So there's the Schiller PE. It's based on sort of 10 year adjusted earnings. Um, and so, one thought, and this is, I think, what Jay is getting at is not every year is created equal. In these years where the valuations, that's Black Tuesday, 1929. Um, this is the tech bubble. This is today. Uh, in, in these higher levels, uh, is it more likely than not that maybe dollar cost averaging would perform better than than lump sum? Well, I have not yet found a study that actually answers that question. Maybe it's out there. I can't find it. Con- just from a conceptual perspective, it kind of kind of makes sense to me. Um, so you say, well, then Rob, what would you do? I'd probably still just put it all in, or, or if I did dollar cost average, it'd be pretty quick. But, but you know, until you're in that situation, you don't really know. And I'm not in that situation. In 2018, I put it all in. Um, in 2018, you know, if we look, go back to the screen in 2018, plus I can drink my tea without you seeing me. Uh, you know, it was still pretty high, and I put it all in, and it worked out. So you know, shows you what I know. Well, I guess that does. I got it right. But I just, you know, it wasn't because I could predict the market. That's for sure. Tim says, more and more people are leaving the transitory camp on inflation. I I think that camp is all but abandoned. I think they tore it down. Uh, If you started investing today, all cash now, what would you invest in, if any, to protect from inflation other than tips? So there again, I would just, it it would be the normal approach, same approach I have now. Um, short term, stocks can really get, get hammered, but long term, stocks are actually a great investment um, in, in inflationary periods, um, you know, because companies, you know, yes, expenses go up, but they can raise their prices, you know, bonds, except for tips, as you've pointed out, are stuck at whatever rate they're at. And so inflation is going to eat away at it. So uh, I would not personally change my approach 
um, because of my expectation of inflation, or even if I knew inflation was going to be whatever, average 5% for the next five years or, or whatever. Um, you know, if we have runaway inflation, I don't know. Um, I guess I'm spending all my money as quickly as I can. I'm not sure. No, I, I, I just, I don't do anything di differently, Tim. Um, yeah. I did buy some tips the other day. I'm in the process of rebalancing everything now that I've got my accounts all and moved, rolled over some 401ks, got it all where I want it. Now I'm good to go and not quite done, but almost. Okay. Vanessa, uh, if you are a short or midterm in, in investor, you may not you may not get the hit, but if your horizon is long, the chance is you'll get you'll get hit. I'm not sure what that question means. So I'm gonna have to pass on that one, but happy to try it again if you post it again. I'm just not sure. Okay. Alex. Some people say growth tech stocks are cheap or even value now. Hmm. Would you agree? No, I would not. What indicators can we look at to confirm or refute if before investing in a small cap growth? So conceptually, let's put aside value and growth for a moment. Um, conceptually, the question is, let's and let's think about it like we're going to buy the whole company, which is how I think if you're going to evaluate individual stocks, that's how I think you should evaluate it. So you buy all of Amazon or Apple or Tesla or whatever. So you're the you're the owner. It's gone private now. You own everything. Uh, and if we were going to buy a company like that, what would we do? Well, we'd be scouring the financials, talking to management, understanding the cash flows, how much of the cash flows have to be reinvested in the company just to maintain its current business. What uh, areas are possible for improvement or, you know, additional new investment, you know, uh, like Apple in, in a car, if they're doing that, or Facebook and the whole metaverse, although they're in free fall today. <laughs> That's a different story, right? And and and, and then what, what would be left over for me, the owner? You know, what, what kind of dividends? We talk about dividends, what, right? What kind of cash flow could I take out of the business? And um, we would do an analysis like that, no different than if we we're going to buy a laundromat down down the street. And at the end of the day, we'd come up with, okay, it's going to cost us for every dollar we, we put into this um, in year one, and then we can project as best we can, we're going to get some money back, right? Um, we might not get it all back in dividends. We might choose to reinvest some of it into new areas of the company. Fine. Maybe we invest it all into new areas for the company. Dividends really aren't the point. It's really what cash is left over after we reinvest into the company just to maintain the current business. And so, so for every dollar, I don't know, let's make up a number. We get 10 cents. All right. So we evaluate that. Is, is that a good deal or not? Some people talk about, well, what's, the, what's your cost of capital? Um, I kind of agree with Warren Buffett on this, that people don't, the whole concept of cost of capital is kind of, I mean, they treat, treat, it, treat it, they teach it in business school, but it's kind of nonsensical. Really, the question you're asking is, do I have a better investment? <laughs> okay. This is going to get me 10 cents on the dollar. Is there one? that I don't think is any less, uh, any more uncertain, which someone would describe, some would describe as that meaning risk, that gets me 12 cents, uh, for example. And, um, and so that's sort of the, the uh, 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 analysis you do. And, and typically growth stocks uh, are very expensive, meaning they're gonna, they're gonna return a lot less than say value stocks, right? Uh, but people are, are willing usually to accept that lower payout. I'm just making numbers up. Let's say it's a nickel for every dollar you invest rather than a value stock is 15 cents. Again, I'm just you know making up numbers, but you know the concept is, is, is what I'm focused on. Some would say, well, I'm willing to accept that nickel. Or in some cases, you take ARC. I mean, many, if not most of the companies in ARC don't make any money, they lose money. We're willing to put our money to work in, in a money losing or company or a company that makes very little because we believe its growth prospects are extraordinary because it's got the latest, elect, you know, it's an electric car company with the, the latest technology or uh, some sort of medical company or, you know, it's, it's some tech. Um, and, uh, and so when you think about growth or value, it's kind of on a continuum, right? Uh, you could whatever and, and what measures they use. You can look inside of index funds and the the index itself, and they'll describe 
don't know if I could find one quickly. Let's see, um, S&P 500 value index. Let's just see if we can describe it. I can tell you, they look at things like um, the PE, price to equity, price to book, right, which is net worth, right? Price to sales. Okay, here we go. Here's an example. So this is the S. So this is not the. Uh, this is the S and P. The Dow. The, the S and P. G, S. S P Global.com website. So this is not. This is the index itself. They're giving you information on, right? And then, the, and then you can have ETFs or mutual funds that track this index. Okay, but uh, right here, let me see if I can make it a little bigger. I don't know. Maybe, kind of. We measure value stocks using three factors: the ratios of book value, earnings, and sales to price. Well, there you go. There were the three. S&P style indices divide the complete market capitalization of each parent index into growth and value segments. And so that's what they use, uh, Alex, at least this index. There could be other value indexes that maybe look at something else. Um, and it's all in a continuum. It's all relative. So you could put all the companies ba based on these uh, metrics, book again, book value, earnings, and sales in relation to price. And you say, okay, everything on this half is value and everything on this half is, is growth. Um, so when you look at a specific stock, like, like um, I don't know, Amazon, a growth stock, I don't know, uh, they are almost universally on the growth side. Are there some uh, tech companies that were growth that maybe fell so much uh, that their value? I mean, I'm trying to think here. Zoom's fallen a lot, right? Is that right? Maybe I'm wrong about that. Hang on, I'll show you the screen in a second. Here's, here's, uh, uh, oh, this is the old stuff. I don't remember where, they might not tell you that. No, that's not it. It could be, Let's go to valuation. This is still not what I'm looking for. In any event, it's possible that there are some uh, tech stocks that have gone into value, but I, I would say generally no. Let's take a look at ARC for a second. This course is a, a fund, not an individual company. Um, but if we go to the portfolio, it's fallen a lot, right? I mean, it's down. It's uh, it's fallen by like half, right? And it, look, it's still way out here, according to Morningstar. Um, you know, we could go to, let's look at QQQ. And go to portfolio. You know, so you have to under, so yeah, it's, it's not as much in the, because ARC was out here, but it's still growth. So, um, you know, I know Kathy Wood at one point said her companies are in deep value. She may view it that way. Uh, but they're not in uh, value stocks by any traditional measure. I think I don't not that I would speak for her. I think her explanation of that kind of comment would be: We think these companies will do so well in the future that their valuations are just going to go right through the roof. And so, by at today's prices, she's in effect comparing today's prices uh, and metrics with what she thinks the future will be. Yeah, I, I think I personally don't think that's a a, a a reliable way to invest, but she might prove me wrong. So anyway, Alex, yeah, I don't think most tech companies, at least the big names, are in value territory. Sorry if I'm down a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, Greg, newish to investing. Well, welcome. Much expert talk that this is the year where you can't ETF it. Almost sounds like a dirty word. Um, are you going to have to pick, oh, you're going to have to pick individual stocks because indices will make huge intra-movements. Your opinion on the validity of this argument, uniqueness of this economic time in terms of passive versus active investing, and if at all valid, how would you approach the markets? Here's what I don't get, Greg. I've heard this kind of argument many, many times, not just now. Um, and... You, you always hear this, this thing about index funds, and let's say that we'll just use the S&P 500. 
Over the long term, it's returned, blah, blah, blah. If you just put money into it and you just left it there and went about your business in 30 years, you'd be wealthy. And we look at all the historical data, and of course, it's true. But then when we get into a time of uncertainty, like now, it seems like that goes out the window. Um, and I talk to good friends that they have their trailing stop losses and their puts and, you know, and I'm like, really? I mean, don't you look at the historical track record and the fact that virtually no one can peg the right time to get in and out? You just can't do it. Um, so that probably gives you an indication of my answer. I own individual stocks, but it's just a few, four of them. I've owned them for about 10 years now, or at least the oldest one, Apple. Um, but that's not going to change. And the vast majority of what we have is in low-cost index funds. Um, and that's not going to change. And part of the bargain, part of the deal is we're going to have bad years. I think if you're new to investing, you said you're newish, the problem you've got is this right over here. This is very unrealistic. Three down years versus five, 10 up years, at least after the Great Recession. That's 2008. This, I mean, look, look back. That's never happened. I mean, you know, maybe, I guess in here, comparable, maybe. Um, maybe, maybe this is comparable, I guess. And then you saw, this is, this is how it ended, the tech bubble burst, right? That's just part of the deal. And so the only alternative to that, that I know of, is to convince yourself that you can peg it right. And I know many, many people who haven't. I've never met someone that has, because you've got to get it right when the market starts to fall. You've got to get it right when the bottoms so that you can get back in. And then you have to do that repeatedly over a, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years of investing. I just don't know anyone that can do that. I know plenty of people who think they can. I was listening to an ad for Fisher Investments. I, I mean, I wouldn't give them my money if my life depended on it. Okay. Well, maybe if my life depended on it, I would, but I wouldn't be happy about it. I can tell you that right now. And there, you know, we, we, we moved to address the markets and we repositioned and I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I don't want, and particularly with your fees. Okay. Zod, have you ever considered investing in EV technology or manufacturers besides Tesla, like QuantumScape, Rivian, or many others out there? I did. I considered it for a couple of days, and I concluded I don't know enough, which is to say I don't know really anything about the electric car market. Uh, I could try to educate myself, but I, I just don't. And valuations seem insane to me. Uh, and, and many of these companies, like Rivian, for example, I mean, has it even sold a car yet? <laughs> I don't think it's made any money, right? Uh, and, and that's just not how I invest. Some people might, you know, we can always look back at companies like Amazon when it wasn't making anything and say, if you'd invested X, you'd have, you know, you'd, you'd be a trillionaire. Um, yeah, it's not making any money, right? Just making sure here. Yeah. I mean, I, when I say it's not making any money, I don't mean it's losing money, which of course it is. It's not even making a dollar of revenue yet. So Zod, I just concluded that's just not how I invest. It's not what's worked for me. So yeah, I, I didn't invest in any. Yeah. Dan, with so many working from home uh, because of COVID, versus traditional offices and the downward trend of malls and brick and mortar start stores are REITs and REIT ETFs still good for IRA portfolios? I think so. And it's an interesting question. And it was a concern of mine for all the reasons you said. I mean, my childhood mall on the west side of Columbus, it's awful. There's this, have you guys seen the site, Dead Malls or something like that? What's it called? Oh, it's deadmalls.com. Let's see if I can search for my old mall. It's, a, it's just a train wreck. Can you search? I don't know. Maybe you can't. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's shuttered. Um, but okay, back to REITs. So um, let's look, let's do, let's look at the Vanguard REIT. And what I want to do, I don't know if it'll show you this. We're looking at VNQ, it's the, it's the uh, ETF version. Um, so the thing to keep in mind is there are different kinds of REITs, right? Like there's a mortgage REIT that owns mortgages, but a lot of these REITs, you can think of REITs as like, maybe they own cell towers, right? Um, let's see if, 
you know, I mean, they give you descriptions, but that doesn't. So hotel and resorts. So I think long term, they're going to be fine. Obviously, they've been hurt uh, during COVID, um, although it's coming back. Healthcare, obviously, still, you know, all as important as ever. Industrial is important as ever. The office could hurt us, uh, I guess, uh, six and a half percent. Right. Um, but I thought there might be like here's American Tower Corp. Right. So um, this is a perfect example. Let me go to Morningstar or let me just Google it. American Tower Corp. It's a REIT. Let's see. Oh, here it is. All right. See, this is what they own. So uh, there are different kinds of, of REITs. And I think, so I think generally um, we should be fine. Uh, I mean, there, there will certainly be bad years for REITs, of course. Uh, and, uh, but if you're talking about a well-diversified REIT, I, I just have a concern. Let me show you another one. Uh, this is an individual REIT. Um, and uh, I like it. I don't own it. And some say it's risky. I don't know. It's called Realty Income. They call it the monthly dividend uh, company or whatever. The monthly dividend company. That's what they call it. And you can see they, they have like Dollar General and Walgreens. So these are retail outlets, of course, uh, but ones that are going to obviously do just fine, I would think. Um, so, yeah, I'm not I'm not overly concerned about REITs. And, you know, actually last year, REITs outperformed the S&P 500. I think mine returned, was it 36 percent? I'm probably making that number up. What did what did Vanguard ETF return last year? Forty, forty percent. Wow! Last year, the Vanguard REIT here. Here, I'll just show you because I don't even believe it. And I'm looking at it. Re returned forty percent. Now this year it's down so far. I have no idea why. Uh, maybe because interest rates have gone up. It's very, they're sensitive to interest rates. Um, so you know, but that obviously it was in the middle of COVID. So you know, this year it's down. That's that's what it does. Fluctuates. But I'm not Dan. I'm not too concerned. Mm -mm. I you know it, I haven't gotten rid of my REIT. Uh, it's ten. 10% of our allocation. Ramon says, I'm investing in VGSH and VTIP instead of having cash. All right. But these funds are falling every day because of the fears of interest rate. Is it better to have cash this year? Well, the first question I ask is uh, what I want the cash for. Or what, like, what's, it, what's its purpose? If I need to spend it, say in the next year. Yeah, I'm not going to have it. These are, I think these are both intermediate term. Let me just make sure. No, no. The first one's short term. VGSA shouldn't be losing that much money. It's a short term treasury. I mean, it may have lost a little this year, but it shouldn't be that bad. Let's take a look. Yeah, it's down 0.7%. I know it's just one month, so that's a lot, I guess. Um, but that, that one, I personally wouldn't be scared to own, even if I needed the cash. Well, not if I needed it right away, but if I needed it in a year or two, it's got a very short duration. Um, the other one is a tip, right? From Vanguard and it's short term as well. This one I would have thought would maybe go up this year. That's down 78 bips. So, um, I don't, it'd be interesting to see how it goes for the year. I mean, these are both short term, but 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 what I was going to say is, if this is just part of your overall asset allocation, I would figure out what your bond strategy is. It doesn't have to be complicated. It could just be a total U.S. bond market or bond market plus tips or whatever. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I just stick with it. That's that's what I do. Um, but if you're going to need the money, you know, the safest thing, meaning the thing that where you won't lose money you know, is to put it in an FDIC insured and maybe online savings account. But I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't do that if it's part of my long-term investment portfolio. Scott says, regarding index funds, since it is passive, who changes the percentage of net assets in individual stocks in the fund's portfolio, or does the net asset allocation change at all? No, it definitely changes. As companies rise and fall, and their value, you know, their values go up and down because each company, this isn't a cap-weighted index fund, which I think most of them are. 
the percentage that the fund owns of that company will, will change. And so there's definitely changes. Uh, you know, and, and in fact, you can see it when we look at what the top 10 companies are that change over time. I mean, you know, years ago, you know, probably well, let's see, let's see who the top 10 are. Top 10 companies in the S&P 500. All right. I don't want to use that site. Let's find a different site. Yeah, let's see what this looks like. Okay. So here they are. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago, you know, less than fewer than 20 years ago, Apple wasn't even in the top 10, right? Um, Coke used to be in the top 10, General Electric, you know. So as, as the company's prices go up and down their values, right, they're going to change their order, uh, they could fall out of the top 10 and their influence on the S&P 500, you know, will go down as they fall and go up as they rise. And, you know, Bank of America, I believe, used to be in the top 10. Of course, Exxon did. I think Home Depot was at one point, I think. Um, IBM was. And look, if you think about that, IBM was. They didn't get, did they get removed? They didn't get removed from the S&P 500, did they? Or did they? I can't remember. They must have, because I don't think they'd be this far down. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe they did get removed. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, so it, it changes. Andrew, congrats on your chess tactical score. Thank you. It's about time someone acknowledges, I don't know, my chess playing prowess. I think it's, it was, it fell back. No, it didn't fall below. It almost fell back below. Let's see. It's 30-20 right now. Okay. Uh, mine's nowhere near. What do you think of FLCOX to tilt a portfolio towards value? I have no idea. Let's take a look. Fidelity, oh, Fidelity large cap value. Here it is. It's, um, so this is an index fund, right? 0 0.035. Uh, if we look at the portfolio, should be large cap value. So it's right here. You can see its PE is around 16 and a half. The S&P is around 21. So that would be a difference. And you can see the difference when you go to the portfolio because, right, there's no Apple, there's no Microsoft. I mean, they may, I doubt they have it in there at all. Um, you know, no uh, Amazon, no Meta. And instead, you see a lot of financials like Berkshire, Morgan, um, and, and healthcare, right? Uh, Bank of America. There's a Cisco. There's a there's a tech company for you that's that's value, but probably not for good reasons. Um, uh, I think this is a perfectly reasonable, low cost way to get value. Not not the only way for sure, but yeah, I like that fund. VJ from Michigan, welcome back. Good morning, Robin team from Ann Arbor. You know, you always mention you're from Ann Arbor. I remember that you're from Ann Arbor. Not that you can't mention it. Hey, you you can yeah, that's fine. Is your coach staying? He's so it's all drama with him. Okay. Foot of snow here on the ground, it's still snowing. See, just another good reason not to live in Ann Arbor. That's number two. There's the first one. Okay. I, you know, VJ, I do I you must have a sense of humor because I give you a hard time about the whole Michigan thing and you keep coming back. All right, Philip. I happen to find your old video regarding the brain and obsidian. Yes, fascinating. Do you still prefer obsidian? If so, maybe an updated video. So um, I probably now use the brain more than obsidian, um, but I like them both. I can do an updated video. Happy to do it. Joel, new investor here. Really appreciate all your helpful content. Can you talk about growth versus value versus blended funds and how, why, you would choose one over the other. Okay, so conceptually, and we'll actually just use this Fidelity fund. So this is the, the Morningstar style box, the tic-tac-toe box. As the, the column, the row headings tell you, if the dot is in, it seems so kind of, if, if, if the dot is in the left-hand column, that's value. If it's over here, it's growth, and if it's in the middle, it's blend. Okay, great, but what does that mean? So again, growth would be, a, we saw earlier 
how they measure it. And not every index um, or website measures it exactly the same way, but it's usually based on a comparison you know, of earnings, book value and sales and other things perhaps to the price. And so um, if it's a growth company, and this, these would be companies that are, are growing faster than average, growing their business in some way, and as a result, investors, at least some investors, are willing to pay more, uh, that ends up having you know, higher valuations on a PE or price to book basis. So that's, that's growth. So you can think Amazon, well, Meta before today, but probably Meta, Tesla, Apple, right? Uh, and then value would be companies that aren't growing as quickly, but uh, to make up for that, the prices relative to earnings and, and, and book uh, net worth and everything are much lower. And so you can think banks, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, Johnson and Johnson, a lot of old older companies, most of which pay dividends, although Berkshire doesn't. And that's value. All blend is is kind of a combination of the two. You put them both in the blender, and then you've got a blended fund. So an S and P five hundred or a total U.S. stock market is a blended fund. I can show you on the screen. We'll do um, we'll do VU, which is Vanguard's S and P five hundred index fund. And we'll go to a portfolio. I think it's tilted towards growth a little bit right now. Yeah, but it's in the blend column, right? It's got a little bit of it both. Uh, and the same thing if we looked at total, total stock market. Go to portfolio. Probably not quite as much growth. Well, maybe. But anyway, it's in the blend, blend box, right? So my way of thinking about taking that information and actually doing something useful with it would be that for the core of my portfolio, I want to blend, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to bet on value or growth. I just kind of want a little bit of everything. So for me, it's total stock market fund. I think the S&P 500 is perfectly reasonable choice. In a 401k, you might have one or the other. I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. It's happened to me before. I picked whichever one I had. Uh, if you want to tilt one way or another, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, I've historically tilted towards value. So what does that mean in terms of actually building a portfolio? Let's imagine you've got a three fund portfolio. It's going to be 10% bonds. We'll say 30% international and 60% US. Okay. So if you weren't going to tilt it all, you can just take that 60% and put it in a total stock fund, right? Total US stock fund, VTI or whatever, VTSAX. If you wanted to tilt one way or another, uh, my approach is always to tilt by 10% chunks. So if I wanted to tilt, let's say, um, in my case, it'd be more likely small cap value. Then I'd leave 50% in, in the total stock market fund or S&P 500. And I take 10% and put it in a small cap value index fund. That's what I usually do. You know, you may choose for, you maybe you like tech stocks and you want to do large cap growth. I personally don't think now's a great time to do that because valuations are really crazy. That's just my opinion. Does, doesn't mean they won't go up. Uh, but yeah, so that's how I would tilt it. I would take 10%, let's say, of my 60% allocated to US stocks. I, I take 10%. So on a $100,000 portfolio, instead of 60,000 in VTI, I'd have 50. And I'd take 10 grand and again, put it in whatever tilt um, I was going to do. And I've done that for years. Uh, and that's kind of how you create a four fund or a five or six fund portfolio. You carve out a chunk and you put it in small cap value, for example. Um, you may car carve out a second 10% and put it in REITs. You may take the 30%, I'm just using those numbers as hypothetical, but the 30% that's inter international, carve out 10% and put it in emerging markets, which is sort of a subset of international. Yeah, so that's how I think about it. So Russell says um, he was told that his taxable portfolio has too much large cap tech, okay? Used to, to be uh, VU plus VXUS, so that's just S&P 500 plus a total international stock fund. Those are both Vanguard ETFs. Now, um, hmm, should I add 10% AVDV 5% AVDV with new money to balance out over time. I don't know. I don't know what AVDV is. Sounds like a rock group. Oh, no, that was ACDC. Oh, man. Okay. Well, 
I guess I'm not really following your question, perhaps, Russell. So um, AVDV is an Advantis, and a lot of people have asked me to review Advantis, and I will. I just haven't been able to yet. An Avantis International Small Cap Value ETF charges eh, 36 basis points. That does for that kind of fund. I, I my guess is that's pretty reasonable because it's international, it's small cap value, so it's going to be more expensive than your typical, say, U.S. based fund, you know, U.S. company fund. Um, I personally don't have any problem tilting a portfolio toward you know the international portion of a portfolio towards small cap value, if that's what you want to do. I don't personally do that at the moment. But this actually is maybe not a bad fund to look at. Maybe I'll do a deeper dive on this. I bet you its PE is low. <laughs> Price to earnings is under nine. Um, this might be a great fund, actually. But I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Um, but what I, I guess the hesitation I have is the, 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 the comment that you have too much large cap tech. Uh, if, if your portfolio is VTI and VXUS, I suppose one could say you've got, I mean, VTI and VXUS are heavily, heavily favored large companies. That's true. We can look at it. Let's, let's do that now. So VTI, here's how you'd, how you'd figure that out. You you'd put the ticker, whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund in Morningstar, go to portfolio and go to the tic-tac-toe board. <laughs> And this is large cap, the blue dot. So large is this row that's, well, it's got large right here. We can actually uh, look at market cap here. The average, the weighted average of this fund is 151 billion. You know, that number in and of itself might not mean much to you. Frankly, I don't know that it means a whole lot to me other than it's a lot of money. But this could help. You go to weighting. So look at this. The majority of this fund is in large cap, right? We've got what? Uh, 19, 21, 28% in small and mid, right? If we go to, um, so that's v, uh, VTI. If we go to VXUS, well, I'm sure we'll see the same kind of thing. Although VXUS definitely has some small cap, at least as I recall. So it's large cap, right? We can go to market cap here. Much smaller, by the way, right? That's interesting than VTI. But if we go to weights, yeah. So it's got some small and mid cap but still predominantly large. So um, if that, I personally don't have a problem with that. I think the allocations to small and mid cap there are perfectly fine. Now I do own small cap. I think that's a reasonable approach too. I think the question I would have for you, and, and maybe I'm misreading, uh, or maybe you typed in the tickers because you have two AVDV. So maybe there was, one was international and maybe one was US, but that would be my question. If you want to add a little more exposure to small cap, which I certainly can't argue with, and I've done that for 20 plus years. What about one that focuses not on international, but on US? And again, that may have been what you were doing. And I just, you typed in the ticker wrong, or I'm misreading it. Probably I'm misreading it. But I, I think that's a very reasonable approach. I don't personally have international value, small cap value, uh, but I'm actually going to dive into that Avantis fund, um, you know, Later, Marv, on the Monday evening video, you guys know I did a Monday, I'm doing Mondays at seven now, Eastern time, not every week, but, but when I can, I've done it the last two weeks. Um, it's a fun crowd, I'm telling you. I mean, they're not as fun as you guys, but they're trying. Okay, on Monday evening video, you mentioned a John Bogle approach where rebalancing was not necessary. Yeah, did I hear you correctly? Yeah. Expand on it. Well, let me see if I can find an article quickly to show you. You can Google it yourself uh, and then read the article. John Bogle on rebalancing. He also didn't believe that international, direct international exposure was necessary. Actually, I did a video on this. What am I talking about? Jack Bogle, never rebalance your investment portfolio. If you Google that or YouTube it, you'll find it. Um, I recorded that in August of last year. Man, time flies. Let's see. Here, okay, here's an article um, that I'll show you. I don't know. Any, I don't know what what this website's about. But what he said, they quoted him somewhere. We just search for it. Here we go. Rebalancing is a personal choice, not a choice that statistics can validate. And I think the basic idea is this. Certainly. 
If you're rebalancing to reduce stock exposure and increase bond exposure, understand that long term, that will, based on everything we know, long term, that will reduce your returns, right? Because stocks return more than bonds. Now, of course, one could say, well, then I'm not going to rebalance. Well, that's fine. Your portfolio will get riskier and riskier over time. And by risky, I mean more volatile as your stock exposure. Let's say you started at 70 30 and now you're at 85 15, right? As it's crept up, your, your portfolio gets more um, volatile. I think what, what Jack, I think, you know, I can't speak for Mr. Bo. He's passed away, but I think he'd probably say, yeah, all right. So I think it's a perfectly valid approach. I rebalance. I don't, I'm not dogmatic about it, like, particularly when it comes to triggering taxes. Um, and I think it does probably become more important in retirement. Um, dep again, depending on your circumstances. But yeah, that was his view. You can check out that article. I don't know if he ever articulated it in detail, like in an article. Um, but I, and by the way, I have no, I, I don't remember what I said to August of last year. So for all I know, I said, for the love of God, you got to rebalance. It's horrible advice that Jack gave us. I don't think I said that. But what do I know? VJ, Rob, can VW, can VT, WAX, and VB, TLX, replace Boglehead's lazy three fund portfolio? Is there a downside? Well, the first one, is that the global stock? I'd have to look. VTWAX. Yeah, so VTWAX is the same thing as VT, I'm pretty sure. And, and VBTLX is just a total bond market fund. Same thing as like BND. I think they're literally the same funds, but mutual fund version versus an ETF version, I believe. I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, the downside is, well, I, I don't know if I had to call this a downside. The reality is with with uh, VTWAX, you don't have control over U.S. versus international. You know, it, it, would a different allocation between those two perform better over the next 10, 20, 30 years? I have no idea. A lot of people think U.S. will continue to outperform. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't really have an opinion on that. I mean, I can think of arguments for and against that. Uh, but I think it's a perfectly reasonable approach if you're comfortable with it. All right. Patrick, how do you deal with financial anxiety? Did you hear my story the last time someone asked me about financial anxiety? Tips on how often to check or not check portfolio balance for someone in their 40s. Well, I tend to check my portfolio every day the market's open, but, but it's more because for me it's fun. Um, there are days, if it's down big, I don't check but I might check the next day it's up. Um, but I think it's a very personal decision. It's perfectly fine for you not to check it. Check it once a year, right? I mean, that's what many would suggest. Certainly if checking it causes anxiety for you, I wouldn't be, if, 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 if checking it caused me anxiety, I would not be checking it regularly. Um, but, but, but beyond that, the thing that gives me the most comfort uh, is not, uh, my asset allocation, you know, the stock bond risk tolerance kind of thing that advisors and brokers put you through. It's it, it, the funny thing is, uh, I don't know if funny is the right word, but what gives me most comfort are things other than my investments. It's the fact that we don't have debt. It's the fact that we live uh, on, on, on an amount of money that's small or small ish relative to what we have. Um, that if I had to, I could go out and make more money if I had to. Um, that we could, we could, we could downsize our lifestyle. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm perfectly happy with our lifestyle, and we have a nice home. And, um, but like, my wife today was like, "Rob, your wardrobe." I'm like, "Well, it's the same five shirts." I'm like, I don't think anyone watching do they notice that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I just rotate them. They're all untuckets. You know, you don't tuck them in. I like them. Um, maybe I should buy more. I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's all of the things not related to investing that actually give us give me comfort. Um, and I think that's not talked about much. You, you go into retirement, you don't have any debt. Um, 
you know, you're going to get some social security, you, you have some investments, you know, you may or may not be living the life you envisioned 20 or 30 years earlier, but, you know, you know, you're in a pretty decent place. And and to me, that's what deals with my anxiety. So I don't have any, for the most part. I'm not anxious about money. I'm anxious about other things. How, let's see, Scott. How do you feel about a balanced fund as a core investment in retirement? I think they're great. You mentioned VWIAX. Oh, well, Wellesley. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, there are a couple of things to think about, you know, you, you know, in a taxable account may or may not be the best thing. Wellesley, we mentioned, I've mentioned this, but in case there are some viewers that missed this, um, one of the things in a taxable account, you want to go to performance here and then distributions, and it shows you what they distributed for the year. And the income would be dividends and uh, from stocks and interest from uh, uh, from bonds. And I think they take their fees out of that too as a way to reduce taxable. I, they, they must, they got to in any event. And this is short term, this column is short term capital gains and long term. And then this just sort of sums it up. But when you look at this, you know, total um, income distributed was what? One, two, three, 50, over four bucks. So you're talking, uh, I don't know what that is, six to seven percent of NAV um, over the course of the year. So, you know, in a taxable account, that's going to hurt, uh, I think. So I probably wouldn't own this or, or most balanced funds in a taxable account. And there might be exceptions. So that'd be one caution. Um, yeah, you can look at their life strategy funds. I don't know if they're a little more tax efficient, but... But beyond that, I, I think they're a reasonable approach. Riley, how much is too much to save for retirement? I think you asked this question. I didn't get to it, or maybe you emailed me. Um, he's trying to find a balance with current spending. It's a great question. So there's a couple of ways to think about this. You could get a, find an online retirement calculator to project what you'll need when you retire. And you said you're... Oh, you're 24, and how much you're going to need to save to meet that that goal sometime in the future, particularly at your age. I would say those calculators are by and large worthless. There's just too many unknowns, inflation, returns, when you're going to retire, future income, um, and so you're saving. So you're saving 25 percent of your gross income. So by all traditional ways to think about it, you're saving enough to, to retire early. Um, obviously, there's no guarantees. Let me show you a site that you might find useful. And I've, I think I've shown you guys this before. And why is it not working? Oh, here we go. It's called Net Worthify. And what you do is you put your income in here. You said you're saving 25%. So let's just, just to make the math easier, I'm gonna put in 100 grand income and 25,000 in savings. Um, this actually says 26%. So this says at that rate, using a bunch of assumptions, which you, you see here, 4% 4, 4 withdrawal rate, 5% annual return, zero current balance. You might have some already saved, I'm sure. Um, but it would take you roughly 31 years to retire. Again, big caveat, you know, this is like projecting who the president's going to be in 31 years. <laughs> I, I don't think we can do that. Um, so, yeah, but this could be useful. Uh, in terms of balancing um, savings versus current lifetime, that's always, that's a tough one. I've always tried to save, to me, I, I, I've always felt that one should endeavor to save at least 20%. I can't... Uh, I felt that that was going to say either allow me to retire early or retire on time, but with a very comfortable retirement. That was where I drew the line. At times we save more than that. At times we save less than that. Um, you know, the other thing is, is what kind of things are you sacrificing? What, what kinds of things uh, would you like to do that you can't do right now because you're saving 25%? Make a list. Maybe... 
try doing one or one of those things and see just how much fulfillment it gives you. I, I, I'm of the view, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, that we're not very good uh, at knowing what makes us happy. We think we do. We think we know what makes us happy uh, and, and that we couldn't go without it. You know, if you, if you have your daily mocha that you need every day on the way to work, if you go without it one day, if you're like me, man, it drives you up a wall. You know, and I used to have a mocha every day. And I went cold turkey, uh, not for money reasons, but for just health and it's not good for you. And I remember for like a week to 10 days, I was like not a pleasant person to be around. No, no, it's like I, I kept thinking about the mocha. <laughs> you know, you, you go off your mocha fix and you go to Starbucks and you get a, a black Americana. I mean, come on. Anyway, but then after two or three weeks, I didn't miss it. Today, if I had one, I would be sick. I, I'd, I'd be sick to my stomach for a day if I drank a, a mocha. Um, and it taught me that, you know, we can really learn to live with or without things. We have much more control over it. Of course, there are things that I would whine about if, you know, they were taken from me. <laughs> I don't know how helpful that was, Riley, but that's my two cents. Gus, I have 2.5 million. Good for you. Next question. No, I'm just kidding. 44% in cash? Really? Okay. 48% in stocks. One stock. Okay. What? So wait a minute, Riley. No, Gus. I'm getting I'm getting my viewers confused. You have two and a half million. And this is you tell me this is at fidelity. I'm sure that's probably not relevant to your question. 2.5 million times 44%. So you've got 1.1 million in cash. You have 48% or 1.2 million in one stock. And of course, 8% in treasuries. I mean, you don't want this to be a risky portfolio. And you're 74, no debt and in excellent health. And I like the way you roll. What would be a good stock market allocation for me? I don't know, Gus. I'm kind of thinking you're pulling our legs. Maybe not. Those are awful specific numbers. What's the stock that you own? That's really the question. I don't even know where to begin. So if I were 74, and I know what you're thinking, aren't you 74? No, I'm not. And I had no doubt, debt. I was in excellent health and I had 2.5 million. I personally would probably have a 70-30 or at that age, maybe even 80-20 because, you know, even at an excellent health, 20 years maybe, I guess it could be more, of low-cost index funds. If I really liked stocks, and I do, I might have some, think 10% or 5 10%. Mine are currently at 20. That's, at the, that's a high side as far as I'm concerned. And that's about it. Now, of course, I don't know if these are taxable accounts. And if they are, then you could have a lot of gains, in which case I'm not sure what I would do. It just depends on a lot of factors. That's what I would do, Gus. You clearly invest in a very different way. That's remarkable, though. I'd love to hear what stock you own. I'm not sure how else to be helpful. Kenny. I like how you asked this question. You donated the max amount recently to a traditional IRA account. Sometimes it kind of feels like that, doesn't it? I'll never see that money again. And then invested in bonds. Didn't learn about a backdoor Roth until afterwards. What do I need to do with bond investments before converting the funds to a Roth IRA? Well, I'm going to assume you're converting to a Roth IRA at the same broker where you're at at the moment. Um, and so the thing to keep in mind with a, with a, with, with a conversion is, um, let me back up. The first question is, did you take a deduction for your IRA contribution? Right. I'm, I'm going to assume for our purposes you did. So when you convert, uh, it's all going to be taxable. Right. Uh, and you, you might not have to do anything with your bonds. You might be able to just move them over in kind. Um, if you're if, if it's if it's a mutual fund and you're moving to a different broker, they may or may not be able to move them in kind. It depends on the fund. Uh, but, you know, you're going to pay taxes anyway. I mean, you could convert it to cash, move it pay your taxes, invest in whatever you want, unless I'm missing something, which is very possible. Backdoor Roths, you do want to make sure you get them right. And there's a lot of factors.
factors that can affect them. If you didn't take a deduction, then what you put in wouldn't trigger taxes. But if you have other IRAs in which you did take a deduction, the IRS groups them all together when you do, even though you're only going to convert a portion of them and does sort of a pro rata analysis to see how much is taxable. So you really want to, unless you're confident in what you're doing, you really want to reach out to a tax professional um, to make sure. But yeah, I hope that helps you. I don't, I mean, there are a lot of caveats and talk to a professional in, in my answer, but the fact that it's in bonds, I don't think in itself, I, I can't think of any issues that would present. Philip, when you mentioned your international percentage, was that the percentage of equities? Uh, so I, I, I separate out my individual stocks when I do my asset allocation. And my asset allocation is 70-30. It's 70-30 in part because of the individual stocks. Because when you when I then add those back in, it's more like 80-20, something like that. So in the 70% that's allocated across the funds, uh, 30% of that, of that is international equities. I don't own any international bonds. Jeffrey, glad you could join us. Casey and Nora, because you are so heavily weighted in individual stocks, have you ever considered put options on those stocks as a way to hedge? Nope. Don't feel like I need to hedge. I know they're going to go down in value, and then hopefully they go back up. And I don't want the expense of buying puts. Or the hassle? Am I, gonna buy, am I gonna buy them all the time? Just keep rolling them over? Um, yeah. nope. My good friend does. Joe, he might be listening. He buys puts, likes puts, trying stop losses. Not, I just, it's no different. You know, this is when we, if we see buying a stock is buying a company, like, you know, you own the dry cleaner down the street, would you buy a put to protect the value? I don't think you could. I guess you could try to do something. It's got to be some way you could hedge. But you don't. You know, the business is doing well. Yeah, it's going to go down in value during a recession. It'll go back up and when good times. Yeah, I just, that's how I approach the whole thing. Sales in a taxable account and purchases in a Roth IRA. I am... 99% sure that it does. I believe it does. That 1% means I could be wrong. This is, but this, I, I know at one point it did. There, this was a big issue. Wash sale, um, purchase, and IRA. Can, here we go. Can IRA transactions trigger the wash sale rule? And this is Investopedia, so you know they've got to be right. Of course, it may take you forever to get to the answer. Uh, here we go. In the ruling, the IRS explained that when shares are sold in a non-retirement account and substantially identical shares are purchased in an IRA for 30 days, the investor cannot claim tax losses for the sale. There you go. That's according to, you can, you can look at Revenue Ruling 2008-5. Whether that's changed, I don't know. What if you break the rule? Here's the question I always had. How will the IRS know you broke it? I'm not suggesting you hide it from the IRS. If that's just a question. Maybe they have a way. Anyway, there you go. Um, bam. Is there, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. Is there a way to see a certain portfolio results performed historically by balancing frequencies using personal capital? No, not that I know of, but we can do that. Let me just show you. Um, we'll do asset allocation. So this is Portfolio Visualizer, and we can select a portfolio. We'll do, uh, we'll just do the Bogleheads 3 fund. And this is not using specific ETFs. This is like an asset class um, approach. I, I'm using this because it'll give us more historical data. And so right now we're, we're rebalancing annual. Let's just do no rebalancing, right? Analyze from 1987 to today, we've got, remember that number. Someone write it down. We'll just call it 219,000. 
Rebalancing is probably going to hurt us because of the bonds. That's my guess. 218,000. Yeah, 186,000. And um, my guess is rebalancing more frequently. Well, you can do bands in here too. Absolute, this is sort of the opportunistic rebalancing. So you can do a lot of different things in here. It's a cool tool. Anyway, we'll go to monthly. That's going to be under 218 as well, I would think. Yeah. Now, one thing you could do is say, all right, well, let's do, let's just focus on the stock portion. And so instead of um, bonds, we will go with small cap value. And we'll start back at no rebalancing. What do we get? 350, we'll call it 4,000. 354. All right. Annual. 354, ah, down, 339. Yeah. Let's see if doing it more frequently. Still down. Now let's look at rebalancing because this would be like the opportunistic rebalancing I referenced. Um, yeah, although you wouldn't really do it this way. You would set your bands based on a percentage of what percentage you have in each asset class, right? What's Okay, we'll just set this to zero. Um, so 354, I think, was our number, if I remember correctly. Yeah, still not better. See, Jack Bogle was right. Anyway, you can play with this tool. This is all the free version. I'm not logged in. Um, I don't know if they give you extra tools for the paid version, but um, yeah. There you go. Alex, thanks for the great content. If I want to tilt my three fund portfolio by 10% to large growth tech long-term, what would you add? Hmm. If it was tech, maybe the QQQ or VUG. I kind of like VUG, V-U-G, um, which is Vanguard's growth. I don't know that it's specifically tech, but sort of tech and growth kind of go hand in hand. Um, let's look at the portfolio. Look at the price earnings. See, uh, I, I, that's why I would never do it. I just can't handle that PE. Um, yeah, but it's the usual suspects. So it's basically the S&P 500 with all the value companies pulled out. But you know, I think QQQ, QQQ is a more focused portfolio. It's got fewer, um, it's, well, as, you, as, you, as we know, about 100, right? So if we go to portfolio, it's... Um, about the same growth, but it's only 100, right, or 102. Um, many of the same ones we saw. Of course, the downside to this maybe is that you get higher exposure to these top companies here. Um, I think those are both reasonable choices if that's what you want to do. I've never tilted my portfolio towards growth, which means, you know, I mean, the last 10 years have been good for growth. But, of course, I have a core portfolio, so I, I benefit from growth. But Akeem. Would you take an opportunity to buy Google now by selling your position on a, on a bond, like a tips bond? Well, those are two different questions, I guess, right? Um, I probably wouldn't buy Google. I generally buy com value companies that pay a dividend. My reason for that is not because I care about the dividend per se. Most of the companies other than Berkshire, though, that I would want to invest in pay a dividend. I like the fact that they're thinking about their shareholders in that, in that way. I don't want them to, I, I still want them to allocate their capital in the most productive and efficient way. Uh, but, you know, the, you know, Google, at least last time I checked, didn't pay a dividend. Maybe they've started paying a dividend. I don't think so. No, they've not. Here they are. And I just, it kind of concerns me. Um, you know, they've, they're, they've just got, they're loaded with cash and I, I get concerned about how they're going to spend it. Um, you know, is your problem? Maybe your question is because they just did a stock split, which has absolutely no bearing on the value of the company. It, it certainly changes, at least in the short term, the price people are willing to pay because people get all excited about a stock split. It's like it's like you know, if you've got your pizza cut in eight slices, and so someone comes along and cuts it into sixteen, and you think you've got more pizza. The reality is you've lost a little because now it's on the cutter, right? You lost more cheese. It's it's not good. Anyway. Um, yeah, so the whole stock split thing is, I mean, there might be times when it makes sense. I know Apple split their stock several times since I've owned it. 
And it's exciting if you own it to see the price go up, but then you think, well, that just makes per buybacks more expensive. If I do get a dividend, not from Google, but an Apple, and if I decide to reinvest it, it's just going to cost me more. So what exactly did I get out of the split? Nothing. Um, I mean, Google's obviously not a great company. Uh, I've always, I worried about this with Apple. It's like, and this was years ago, when I first invested in Apple, 2013, my concern was they're all iPhone. What if the next iteration of the iPhone is not, not good? Um, now it's worked out so far. And of course they've diversified, although clearly iPhone is obviously central to the company. But I think, well, what if someone comes along and builds a better search engine or just a better way generally to find stuff on the internet? It seems unlikely. Uh, I don't know. It's probably a silly concern. I mean, what's their, 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 what's their forward PE? The way Morningstar does some of their data drives me crazy. Like I cannot find the PE for a company. Well, here we go, maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. They keep moving things around. Well, anyway, I know I can just go to, I don't need Morningstar. Let's just look them up. Their PE, that's not terrible. 28, actually. That's not bad. Akeem, I mean, relative to today's market. Okay. I don't know if any of that was helpful. Travis. Currently in the process of transitioning my 74-year-old mom to assisted living, which costs $7,000 a month. She has $325,000 in savings plus $5,300 a month in income. How can we optimize her savings to last and leave behind? Boy, that's a great question, Travis. Well, assuming, I'm going to assume that that, that the cost of, of the assisted living is coming from her assets. So, you know, she got 5,300 a month in income. She needs another 1,700 to pay the monthly fee. That's going to presumably come out of the 325. Um, so, you know, you're looking at what, 20, roughly 22 grand a year. Um, so, so that's going to come out. So you've got this, this income need, right. That you, you've got to deal with um, in, in your planning. And um, so I, you know, that's a tough one. I think what I would do, I would, I would talk to a financial advisor personally, not to invest the money, but whether you, that's what you want to do, you, you can choose yourself. Um, but, but to walk through all the different scenarios, including at what point perhaps can you rely on, like, for example, Medicaid, maybe, um, and, and how that works and what you should do with the assets uh, for that. So there's, there's questions there that go beyond just how do you invest the money, right? And um, I, I would I would speak to a financial advisor to understand all of those issues and opportunities. Um, in terms of the actual uh, money, honestly, I tend to invest in a very similar way um, with low cost index funds. I don't know what asset allocation I would use. Um, it would certainly have a, you know a significant portion of fixed income, uh, but that would depend on on answers to some of those other questions. Uh, so that's what I would recommend because when you get to those sort of, you know, questions as 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 people age, and, um, there are a lot of different things at play, right? You've got Medicare, you've got Medicaid potentially, um, and they're certainly beyond me. Um, so that's why I would talk to an advisor. Probably, I don't know. I hope you didn't spend a lot of time on the show waiting for a silver bullet answer. Because there isn't one. But, but that's what I would do. But I wouldn't talk to someone who want, who's, who's thinking they're going to get this money to invest at 1% AUM or something. You want a truly unbiased opinion. And you can't get that from a, fiduci from a fiduciary who wants to get your assets and charge you 1%. Let me just talk about that briefly. Because, uh, you know, I did a video on fees. One of the things that I realized, you know, and I've thought about this off and on, but this is true with mutual funds, ETFs, and advisor fees. All of the, 
none of these fees involve you getting an invoice or me receiving an invoice each month or having the amount deducted from our credit card or a bank account, right? If it did, I think we would see the fees in a totally different light. You know, if you've got, a, if you're retired, you got a million dollars and, you know, you're paying someone 1% plus they're putting you in expensive mutual funds and you see your credit card getting hit for 1500 bucks a month. Hello. But you, you don't see that. They quietly take it out of your funds. You don't even see it. Does, it's not even reflected in your statement, at least all the ones I've ever seen. Uh, you know, you're talking about regulatory change. That's where we should change it. I tell you, we can get that changed. Um, and we'd see fees come down, in my opinion, because people would be start complaining. Who wants to who wants to pay 1500 bucks a month? Well, we, we don't. We don't feel it because we don't see it. All right. Kentora, Fargo, North Dakota. Welcome. I spent a very cold winter in North Sioux City, South Dakota. I was counsel for Gateway. Remember Gateway 2000? I love that, that work. That was fun. Cold. <clears throat> Not as cold as Skagway, Alaska, though. Ram, yes, the brain is proprietary. I get that. And Obsidian, Obsidian is, is not, or you know, it uses basic markdown files. But the brain is really cool software. I'm willing to take the risk. And you can incorporate markdown files in it. Clarice, good morning. What features do you use in Stockover? Uh, Stock Rover is an interesting tool in that it is incredibly robust. And as a result, there's a learning curve for it. Um, and uh, I've only begun the process of learning it. I mean, there's far more that I don't know about this software than I do know. I'm going to see if I can pull up a demo portfolio that I've used in the past. Huh. So here's one. Um, so this was just a demo portfolio, the 712 portfolio, which is a portfolio I want to review. And I put it into um, Stock, Stock Rover. And so the, the, the hard thing that I found in learning Stock Rover is it, it provides you so much data that you have to spend some time understanding where things are and how they work. Once you do that, um, it's a very robust tool. And so, uh, for example, in this portfolio, I, I think I set all my portfolios up to be a million dollars. Um, it's lost some money since when I don't remember when I set this up. Oh, uh, yeah. But like, like future income. So if we click that, um, this shows you the projected income of the portfolio. I find that interesting and useful. Um, you can also, they've come up with what they call, let me just see if I can pull it up here. Here it is. It's future simulations. It's this tab right here where you can simulate, and it's in beta, and you can you can simulate what the, the future returns of this portfolio will be. Of course, garbage in, garbage out. What you put in here is going to matter. And but it, it's basically Monte Carlo is what it is. But but it's a Monte Carlo on your specific portfolio. I, I don't. I use this. I, I've used this tool. They just came out with it. Um, more out of just interest right now. It's not like I make an investing decision on this. Um, but then the other thing you can do, and let me pull it up here. Like if you go to, um, let's just see. I want to make sure I've got the right portfolio. It keeps switching the portfolio from what I want, which I find kind of annoying. But that, that could be user error. So in the display here, you can look at a table chart, insight, or all. And I mean, it provides a ton of data on, on these are all uh, ETFs. Um, you get the dividend calendar, when it's going to pay. Uh, of course, you can look at returns. You can look at cash flows. Now, this is an ETF, so that might be a little more relevant for an individual stock. It also has um, built-in portfolios. So in this library, let me just pull it up. Portfolios, here we go. They have all these built-in portfolios, uh, some from well-known investors. Here's Warren Buffett's top uh, 25. But they have things like um, uh, Rick Ferry's Core Four. It's got a two fund. His Core Four is here. Um, you can, and here's what it is. So you could add that in 
and evaluate it. So, I mean, and I'm only just scratching the surface. It really goes on and on and on. And um, yeah. So, but but I, I have not used it as thoroughly as I have like personal capital or, or new retirement. New, new retirement serves a totally different purpose. Um, yeah. So there you go. It's a great tool. I like it a lot. You, you just have to be prepared to, um, you know, to, to buckle down and learn it. They have a lot of videos that help. Okay. Kyle and Emily, 40 years old and have 500000 in a brokerage to build a house. Oh, great. Pay for house in full with brokerage money or get a mortgage, 15 or 30 years, and withdraw periodically. I guess withdraw to, to pay for it? Not, I guess. At WWRBD. Well, oh, that's what would Rob Berger do? Eh. Well, we don't want to start that. I mean, so... Um, I would, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would, first of all, I would never put myself in a position without ample liquidity. So like if the 500,000 was pretty much all I had, uh, I would not spend it. Um, I, might, I might use some of it for down payment. I certainly would put 20% down to avoid um, uh, insurance and uh, your mortgage insurance and to get a better rate. By the way, you want to talk to a mortgage broker because sometimes putting like 19.9% down can actually get you a better rate and then you pay mortgage insurance for like a day and a half. Uh, it's, a, it's a racket. So you want to talk to a mortgage broker. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, if I, was, if I were flush and had plenty of money and maxing out my 401k and IRA for years and have another whatever million or two um, invested and making plenty of income, um, I'd, I'd probably pay it off. Uh, just pay for it. You know, if you if you run the numbers, see, people like to run the numbers. And if you run the numbers, it makes sense to have a mortgage, right? If, if you assume you're going to invest that at like an S&P 500, uh, you'll have down years, but long term, you're going to make more than your mortgage, particularly your mortgage as adjusted for any tax breaks you get. Um, but it's really comparing two very different things, a, a risk-free investment, paying off the house rather than getting a mortgage, and a, and a very volatile investment, stocks. Um, so I, liquid, liquidity would be an important issue for me. That, that would probably drive my decision more than um, market returns and, you know, versus a low, low cost um, mortgage. One thing you might do, even if you have plenty of liquidity, is to go ahead and, if you're not sure, go ahead and get the mortgage, because you can always pay it off, right? So, or you can pay it off in chunks. So, you know, as long as you don't take that 500,000 and blow it, <laughs> uh, um, you know, you could sort of give yourself some time to think through the question and, and feel the mortgage and live in the house and, you know, all of those sorts of things, which is ultimately what I did. When we paid off our mortgage, I didn't, didn't just wake up one morning and say, okay, I'm stroking a check for whatever. And we ended up paying it off in chunks over time. Yeah, there, there's an emotional side to this, right? And what you, how you feel today may not be how you feel tomorrow. So I try, to, I try to make choices that I can undo if possible. So I don't have any profound regrets. Um, and I don't, I don't really know why my hands are moving like this, but yeah, that's what Rob would do. Tom. Hey, Rob, love the show, and thanks for all the time and energy you put into it. You're welcome. If using a long-term time horizon and using a three-fund portfolio strategy for ETFs, does it make sense to use PE ratios as a guide for where to put new money? Well, it can. The problem is, and I'm actually kind of focused on this very question, I'm looking at like international small cap value, emerging market. Um, I, have, I already have emerging market in my portfolios, but but more small cap. Depending on the fund you're looking at and trying to maybe, you know, get a fund that you think's got low valuations, you could end up complicating your investment strategy, right? So, you know, you, you, you buy a couple of funds and maybe they're good investments and you wake up one day and instead of a three fund portfolio, you've got a nine fund portfolio. And some of them are in taxable accounts with gains that you can't easily get rid of. 
And all of a sudden you're thinking, well, I made a little more money and that's good, but now I've got this complicated, see here my hands go again, this complicated portfolio. So there's always trade-offs to all of this. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is just because you buy something with a low PE doesn't mean it's going to go up in value anytime soon. International stocks have had low PEs for a while. That didn't just happen. And um, just because a PE is high doesn't mean it's going to go down. I mean, the, you know, we've looked at the, the Schiller PE earlier in the show. It's been high for a long time now. And things keep going up. Now, again, we all know, I think we all believe, eventually that will change. We just don't know when. Um, by, the, by the looks of it, it might be changing today. Market's down a little bit. Not that bad. So, you know, I am looking like as part of my stock portfolio, possibly buying some sector ETFs or something like an emerging market small cap or international small cap value and sort of treating it like a stock investment, not including it in my asset allocation. The, the, the one thing that's holding me back is not the investment. It's that I really like to invest in things in a taxable account that I'll never sell. Um, now, of course, things can change that. There's no way, we, you know, we can't guarantee that things won't change. And, Maybe I'll sell something. I'm not sure like an, an, an international small cap value, emerging market small cap is that kind of investment for me. That's what's holding me back. And I'm just sort of, I'm mulling it over. Neil, did you attend the online Vanguard 22 meeting? I did not. It would have been fun, but I didn't. Let's see. Whoops. If you're joining, if you didn't see the beginning of the show, please tag me at Rob Berger uh, if you have a question, because I see it, it comes up in orange. Uh, Russell, I have 250,000 in mutual funds, which is 50% of his taxable portfolio, concerned about 30 plus year of fees. Yeah. Should I let it ride or sell or reinvest dividends elsewhere? And he gives some fund examples. Let's take a look at it. Let's see what kind of fees Russell's paying. So he's got AMCPX. Well, it's American funds. Well, these are A shares. So on top of the fees, you probably paid five and three quarters to get in, right? Some American funds have done extremely well, by the way. I don't know about this one. I would be, so American funds are, are inexpensive as actively managed funds go. This one's 68 basis points. Oops, let me show it to you. That's expensive when compared to an index fund, but I mean, most uh, many actively managed funds are over 1%, some are over two. Um, I don't know how this one has performed. We actually, let's just compare it. This is a growth. So we'll put it in, and the ticker is AMCPX. There it is. We're going to compare it. We'll compare it to VUG, which is a much lower cost growth fund. I don't know how comparable they are beyond that, but eh, whatever. So we've got, what, 17 years of data. Honestly, well, I don't know which one outperformed. Well, boy, VUG crushed it. By the way, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll crush it going forward. And we could look at... Uh, trailing returns. And in fact, up until about, I don't know, 2016, 2017, really 2019, they were, you know, very similar. Uh, the outperformance has been here in the last couple of years. And who knows if that changes. Um, but part of it depends on um, uh, the your taxes. You know, what are you paying taxes to sell these things? You know, you could just reinvest the dividends into lower cost funds. And that, that might be a starting point. That might, that might be what I would do as a starting point. The downside to that is, once again, you complicate your portfolio because you still have your American funds. And now you have two or three or four other low cost funds. Yeah, you know, is it the end of the world? Uh, not necessarily. But this is the tricky thing about investing in a taxable account. You get locked into what you're investing in. I am curious. You've got some other tickers here. Is that American? This is American Growth, uh, the Growth Fund of America. Yeah, you you own AGTHX. This fund has done extra extraordinarily well. I think. Let's uh, a 
GTHX. Let me just AGTHX. Um, and let's, I, I don't remember if this is a blend or what this is. No, it's growth as well. All right, so let's compare that to VUG. So same 17 year period. Oh, it's still underperformed, interesting. Okay, um, so again, the, the tax issue is tough. I mean, I can't give you tax advice. It's gonna depend on your circumstances, what, what you'll pay if you sell, how much of, uh, of the funds, how much what your gains are in these funds. You know, one option, as you mentioned, is reinvest your dividends in something else that's lower cost. Um, you could exit the, the, the positions over a number of years if that helps you uh, tax-wise. You may be in the 15% tax bracket no matter what you do at the federal level, um, but maybe not. Maybe you can get some into the 0% level uh, bracket for capital gains depending on your income. Um, so I, I would just, I, you know, that that's a tough one. I, I, I feel your pain. I understand the issues, but there's just no silver bullet that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm sure the things I've said, you've already thought of. I, I wish I wish I could be more help. And Kit, if I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, but I think he gets the award for the best comment of the day. If there was a fund which was a total market fund but excluded anything which Jim Cramer recommends, I will buy that all day. Better if it's shorter what he recommends. Well, see, now I see a, there's a problem with your your proposed fund. I think he recommends just about everything over time. So I don't know. It could be empty. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe not. All right. Kevin. I'm a 37-year-old investor and use a fund of funds approach. Great. For retirement. 401k is 100% VTRLX. Roth is 100% FFNOX. And taxable brokerage is 100% VTMFX. Any concerns? I have lots of concerns. I'm concerned about how the Ohio State Buckeyes are going to perform next year. But do I have any concerns about your portfolio? Well, let's see. VTRLX. That is the 2050 fund, and that's in a retirement account. No, no concerns there. It's institutional, so you get the fancy 9%, 9 basis points expense ratio. It's it's basically, as I recall, a 90-10 portfolio. Yeah, close. Uh, I, got, I got no concerns. Um, in the Roth, you've got FFNOX. That's a fidelity fund, right? Oh, multi-asset. So uh, no concerns here. Well, this is more expensive, just so you need to know that. What's the... Oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, it's interesting to me. So what's it invest in? Huh. But this, I, I don't believe this changes the asset allocation over time, right? Just something to keep in mind. But in any event, it's what, 85, 15? Okay. And I didn't, I didn't realize that they had multi-asset funds that were that inexpensive. That's what's throwing me off. But at least based on what I see here, that looks like a reasonable fund to me. Now, in the taxable brokerage account, that's where we could have trouble. Oh, but it's tax managed. Look at that. Only nine BIPs. Portfolio. So um, how old are you? 37. So the one, of course, I don't know how much you have in each account. Uh, this is a pretty um, modest uh, allocation to stocks, in my opinion, not knowing anything about you, but I'll just use me as an example. When I was 37, well, honestly, it's hard to remember when I was 37, but I'll try. And as best as I can recall, um, this would be too conservative. However, depending on how much you have in the other funds and in this one, your overall asset allocation may be perfectly fine. Right, it may be you don't have as much in here. Uh, it's tax managed, that's good. But I'm curious what that means on the fixed income side. Like, do they use municipal bond funds? Oh, it looks like they put it all in the Vanguard taxes and bond fund. Yeah, so they use a muni fund. Huh? I don't, I don't think I've ever seen this fund. I don't know why. 
let's look at distributions. Although I wonder how Morningstar deals with distributions. Oh, this is very efficient. Yeah, look at that. 13, that's well, I guess that's just, yeah, I got to add them up, but it's what, 60 cents, 59 cents on a 42 nav. Yeah, very efficient. So I don't personally have any concerns with these. I, you know, the one question would be, is your overall asset allocation what you want? Given that the one taxable fund, the Vanguard Tax Managed Balanced Fund, is roughly 50 50. Yeah, I'm glad about that fund. I don't think I've run across that on the show before. You're the first, Kevin. Gus, why don't you install an ad blocker? <laughs> I should. They're annoying, aren't they? I'll do that. For you guys, I'll do that. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So Mike, uh, the, the pink hair, uh, pink wig, what do we call it, guy? He says, I agree on your rant, keep ranting. The problem is I've been ranting on so many different things now. I don't remember what rant you're specifically referring to. Yeah, I will do the ad blocker. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Um, Conrad, I have a 90-10 refund portfolio in a taxable account. I'm looking at value funds. We'd love to hear your thoughts on VTV versus VBR. Also, how much of an allocation is too much for tilt? Well, let's first look at the funds. And I'm sorry about the ads on Morningstar. Um, I lost my, uh, here we go, VTV. So uh, we've seen this. This is the Vanguard value. And this is like, um, I think this crosses all uh, company sizes, I think. Maybe not. Oh, no, it doesn't have any small cap, but it's got these, um, big cap and large cap. That's VTV. Um, and the other one is VBR. So I see. So you would, you would use them both, I guess, combined, maybe to cover the whole market, right? This is going to be, it's, it's, its title is small cap, but I'm pretty sure this has mid cap too. Take a look-see. Go to wait. Yeah, so that's good. Um, so, yeah, these two funds combined would basically cover, you know, small to large, everything on the value side. Um, and I think tilting towards value is perfectly reasonable. I've done it mainly on the small cap, but there have been times when I've had large cap value, although it's been many, many, many uh, years ago. I tend to go in 10% increments. So I would think um, what, what I would do is probably 5% in each. Um, maybe seven and a half. I, personally, I just don't go beyond that. You know, then I have my core for whatever the total U.S. allocation is. I guess the thing I would say is there's no way to know the right answer for your investing time horizon, right? Which one's going to work out? We could look at history and you could take that into account as much or as little as you wanted to. We know that small cap value has done very well um, historically, although not as much recently. Um, but, but ultimately, I just pick something that, that I'm comfortable with. And I think the key is... You know, one thing you might do, let's go back to Portfolio Visualizer for a second. I'll pull this up on the screen. Um, let's, um, let's imagine we've got a total U.S. market, 100%. And then we do a, um, we'll do large cap value, 100%, and we'll do small cap value. We'll skip the mid cap because there's only three columns. All right. Now, if we look at this, which one's going to win? The answer is small cap value. Crushes it, right? Six, I don't know, and I apologize if I'm moving too quickly. 6.7 million versus 2.2 two versus 1.6. Uh, but we're looking at it from 1972. So this was, I'm trying to think. Um, I guess Nixon was president. When did he go? Carter was 76. So Ford came later, right? Later meaning after Nixon, not after Carter. Anyway, long time ago. It's kind of the point I'm trying to make. So now let's say, okay, well, forget that. Let's look at more recent times. We'll do, oh, I don't know, from the last 10 or so years. Ah, look at that. They flipped. <laughs> now U.S. stock market's up. And small cap value is the worst. 
The point is, there can be fairly long periods of time where uh, you know a, a tilt will significantly underperform the market. And by the way, we didn't compare that to growth. You know, we compared it to total U.S. market. If we compared it to growth, it would have really underperformed. And so you have to be willing to live with that. And so that's why I tend to not put, if I'm going to do small cap value, my limit would be 10%. Um, if I'm going to spread it out over small, medium, and large, it'd still probably be 10% would be my limit personally, because that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, can you live for a decade while you're underperforming? That's the question you need to ask. At least that's the question I try to ask myself, and I try to be as honest with myself as I can be. Sometimes I lie to myself. That's never good. All right. Lee says that a very large sum to invest could give you freedom to take more risk. Absolutely true. Even if it goes badly, short term, you'll have enough to, to live off of. That's true. Yeah. But at that point, though, you know, why are you going to invest in riskier assets? We're, again, we're talking about in the context of like the stock market and ETFs and mutual funds and I guess individual stocks. And if you think you've got some better approach than a handful of low cost index funds, why not pursue it now? Maybe not to the same degree you would if you had whatever, $100 million. But I mean, in, in, unless you've got, you really need and you can't stand to lose, you know, well, the way we invest, you're going to lose some in the short term, but you know, you're really just barely making it. Why not? If you've got this great idea and you believe in it, why not put some money towards that now? That would be my question. Bill, I have a Fidelity 401k. I am retired. Congratulations. I have VXAIX and S&P 500. I can't remember. And I said V, didn't I? It's FXAIX. Fidelity 500 index fund, good. MRRGX, Meridian Growth Institutional. Never heard of that one. What's the portfolio? Ah, small growth. Okay, U.S. All right. Um, uh, this is interesting. A Vanguard 2020 fund, so that's basically just fixed income. I mean, I don't, do they have any... Do you have equity in that at all? Fidelity Counter Fund. What do you think? Uh, let me look at the, uh, I'm looking at the 2020 fund. It's got to be almost all fixed income. Yeah, well, 70% is, oh no, no, it's not. Okay. So it's like 60, 55% fixed income. Um, it's an interesting portfolio. So the, the Contra Fund portfolio, which I did a video on, is basically at the moment large growth, right? So you've got large growth, you've got small growth in um, the Meridian Fund, then you have sort of a blend, which is the S&P 500, and then, and then this fund. Well, so a couple of, again, I'll just evaluate how I would think through this fund for me. I would say, okay, well, the first thing that matters is how much I have in each, because that tells me my overall asset allocation. For me, mixing balanced funds with regular, like S&P 500, for me, gets confusing. I'm, I'm, if I'm going to use a balanced fund, I'll use a balanced fund, maybe with one other fund, if I'm really just got to have whatever, small cap value or something. But when you mix them, it's, it's hard to think through your asset allocation. Yes, you can use tools like Personal Capital or Stock Rover. Um, by the way, you can link your, your accounts to Stock Rover like your personal capital um, or some other tool. Uh, and that gives you your asset allocation. Maybe that's okay. But I just kind of prefer to go one approach or the other. That's just me. You know, I'll have some exceptions. If I've got some small HSA or whatever, maybe it's just easier to throw it in a balanced fund and then forget about it as it relates to the rest of my allocation. But for me, it gets difficult to, to, to um, keep track of the asset allocation when I'm mixing balanced funds with um, regular, I guess, I don't know, regular funds. It's not that it's bad. It's just, for me, it's harder to manage. 
And then you, you like, you're obviously tilted towards growth. I've never tilted towards growth, which means I've lost out on the, in the last decade, right? Um, but I'm pretty sure Fidelity Contra Fund is growth. I mean, I just did a video, but let me just double check. So oh, why isn't it coming up? I forget the ticker. FCNTX, I assume that's the fund you're talking about. I'm pretty sure it's growth. Yeah. So I generally, so you've got small growth and large growth. I've generally not been comfortable tilting it that way. You've probably done very well though, right? Uh, at least recently, so that's great. Um, but particularly with the valuations, I'd be even more concerned right now with the valuations. That's my view. Um, but again, in order to evaluate a portfolio, you need to know how much you have in each. And so that tells you your overall asset allocation. So if, if you don't know what your overall asset allocation is, I would recommend you can you can do it by hand, right? And use Morningstar, which is free. You could connect your accounts to personal capital uh, and they'll give you your asset allocation. That's free. Stock Rover, there's a fee. So I don't know, Bill, I hope that helps. Um, oh, here's a good one. What do you think about Fundrise and other e-REITs? I am already contributing the max to my 401k HSA and also investing through my taxable account that has been so, uh, th oh, this has been so informative, thanks. I, I like them in concept. What was the one that I, I actually met folks from? What was it? I can't remember their, their name now. It'll come up here. A oh, Acre Trader. Here, here they are. Um, where you invest in farmland. Uh, in fact, they're in theory an affiliate of mine, but I've never actually promoted them. Uh, not, not for any reason. I like, the people there seem great, and it seems like an interesting way to invest. Um, the one thing I'll tell you is, and, and this is what's, in, well, there's two things that have held me back from using Fundrise, which I think is a good option, or Acre Trader. Uh, there's two things. It's I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to simplify my my investment portfolio, and not make it more complicated. And this would just be one more thing I'd have to deal with, one more form I'd have to give my accountant for taxes. And I just I you know I've just decided it's not worth the complexity for me. Uh, and then um, you've got to be mindful of the taxes, and the tax treatment can vary from one investment to another within Fundrise or Acre Trader. Because you're basically, as you, as you see here, you're actually investing in a specific, you know, project. So I don't know what I don't I don't know a thing about this particular project, but you know you can look at the financials, and I guess you got to log in. In any event, you know you could create a an account and log in. Um, and the, the taxes, if they talk about the taxes, at some point they do uh, somewhere but I don't know, maybe it's in documents or you have to log in. So uh, I think if you're interested in investing in real estate, but you don't want the headaches you know, of actually buying property and you'd like to get more involved than just putting your money in a REIT, I like these kinds of services. Always have to be mindful of fees, um, but it adds complexity. You got to make sure you understand the taxes. I've got time for one more question. I'll answer Bill's question. If you had a windfall of 150,000 and were new to investing, would it be a good plan to dollar cost average 10,000 a week into a 70% VTI, 20% VXUS and 10% bonds? Absolutely. I would, I think all of this is my opinion, right? Um, I think that would be totally reasonable. 15 weeks should be done. You know, uh, I might do it. I might not do it that way, personally. Um, I might bump some it. I don't know. But uh, I think that's absolutely a reasonable approach. And one question that I was asked recently in an email that I want to address kind of relates to this. It was someone who was totally new to investing. They'd opened up a Roth IRA, and I think they had used a three-fund portfolio, not like what uh, Bill, what you've described, and they put some money in. Now, one thing to keep in mind, you know, you, you go to like a, a Fidelity or an M1 Finance or Vanguard or wherever, and you open up, a, 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 a in this case, a Roth IRA. It could be a traditional, but you open up a Roth IRA. Right now, you have an account, 
right? There's nothing in it. So then you, they're going to ask you, how do you want to fund your account? You, know, you can send them a check. You can deposit checks via smartphone, you know, snapping a picture, or some services allow you to do it. Um, or you can connect your bank account. And so let's say you decide, if Roth IRA, you're going to put 1000 bucks in. You put the money in, and what happens to it? Where is it invested? Well, it's not invested anywhere. It's in a cash account, typically a money market fund of some kind that earns basically 0.00% APY. And it just sits there. I, I've talked to people who didn't realize they had to do something else. They just, oh, it's in the Roth IRA. Good. That's my retirement account. It's working for me. No, it's not. Nothing's happened yet. Uh, well, you've put money in, but it's not invested in anything. And it's something I want to stress. When you know, I've been doing these live shows for a while. They seem to be fairly well received, and I'm going to keep doing them. I really want to encourage folks out there. I know I don't. I, I never get to all the questions, and I'm sorry. I see a whole bunch. Um, I really want to encourage you to ask questions, particularly the new investors. Don't you know, don't think that the question is silly or some some are probably embarrassed or too shy. I really encourage you to ask questions, um, uh, because when you're starting out, the terminology doesn't. It isn't um, obvious, you know, it's confusing, and I get that. And that's true of probably any endeavor. And so in this case, the question was, he had actually taken the money and invested it. So you literally are going to buy, if you're going to use ETFs, 1000 bucks, we'll use Bill's portfolio. You're going to take $700. Well, and he's using 150 grand, but we'll use 1000 Let's say we're going to invest it all at one time. However, this, the, the platform works, let's just say it's Fidelity, you're going to literally place a buy order. You're going to type in the ticker, VTI. It's going to be a market order. You're going, to, you're going to buy, you can buy a number of shares or just a dollar amount. You're going to pick a dollar amount, $700. You're going to preview your order. You're going to buy it. And you'll buy it almost instantly if it's an ETF, particularly that kind of ETF. And then you're going to put 20%, so $200 in VXUS, same thing. 10% or $100 in our hypothetical into BND. The question that the, he then asked was, he goes, I'm confused now. Does my money grow, you know, based on what I've done or do, or do I add more money each month? And, um, and so, I, you know, I emailed him back and I said, look, over time, the money you've put in will grow, but you want, you want to continue to invest, obviously with a Roth is an annual limit. But you, you, know, you want to continue to save uh, based on whatever plan you've got to build wealth over time. So, so both things happen. Yes, whatever you have in there grows. You can continue to buy more shares. You can automate the process in most places where you know, uh, a set amount comes out of your checking account, you know, whether it's a taxable account, a brokerage account, or an IRA. Obviously, with an IRA, you, don't, you can't go over the limits. Um, but you can set it up monthly, quarterly, whatever. Uh, and, um, but, but, you know, there was some confusion, I think, about the, sort of getting this thing set up and getting things moving. And I get it. It's confusing. And like I said, I've had people that, that had money in a money market account for years in a Roth or other IRA and didn't realize that their money wasn't working for them. And that's okay. Well, if that happens, you know, learn from it, move on. But these sort of uh, questions are important. We got to get these things right. So if you have them, I want to hear about them in the chat. Hopefully, I, I, I'll get to them. I will read through this chat after you know the show's over, which is over pretty much now, um, and maybe circle back on some uh, next uh, next week. I, I, I've been doing the, the chat every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. The last two weeks, I've done Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I'm going to do Mondays as much as I can. Uh, I usually don't know until that day, but I'll, I'll set it up in YouTube ahead of time so you'll see it there pending if you're a subscriber to the channel. Um, uh, one thing, I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, I did, but I, I'm probably not going to be able to, to write individual responses to emails. It's just, yeah, I did mention that at the beginning. It's just, I, I can't do that. But I do read every single email. And what you email me often comes up in... Uh, either the live Q&A like I did today at the start of the show or, uh, you know, in videos that I record. And if you have topics you want me to cover, love to hear about them. So please let me know. So that's it. Um, appreciate you all joining. Hope you have a great week. Until next time, remember, best thing money can buy. It's financial freedom.